Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Excited to talk to you. So thanks for giving me this time. Oh, thank you. Thanks for talking to me. It's always nice Great. to see thank the face you. behind the words, you know. I have here a proof copy of your book. So Yay. I'll just start by introducing you, okay? Okay. Let me find your little bio. There we go. Christina Hanneman is a writer and teacher based in the beautiful west of Ireland. She grew up in Germany and started writing her first English poems at the age of six with the help of a dictionary. Since moving to Ireland, she has been writing professionally. Her work has appeared in Orange Peel, Anti-Heroin Chic, uh, Goat's Milk, Free Verse, Revolution Lit, Tina Nog, and elsewhere. Christina writes about the subconscious mind, trauma, the healing power of nature, and spirituality and relationships. You have your own website where people can check out your work. It's christinahanneman.com. And you are also active on Instagram. We'll put the handle in the description later so you wrote a book <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah it's so exciting i still can't believe it i don't have it here i, I haven't actually put my I hands on it, hands. So. <laughs> it's gonna come to you soon so that you can sniff it and hold it <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the book yeah so i thought about this question a lot because it was kind of hard for me to sum it up but then um i just think it's about a journey like a literal journey to ireland because i am not from ireland as my accent probably gives away to yeah. irish people you have a mix um, a mixed accent yeah. now yeah <laughs> <laughs> still changing all the time um but yeah the speaker kind of just uh, travels to a foreign country which is ireland and then um, but it's also an internal journey where the speaker goes through heartbreak and, and a love story that doesn't really work out. And then it kind of causes the speaker to dig deeper into her past and confront her traumatic experiences in childhood and just dig at the roots of where her issues in relationships may come from. You say her, do you do that on purpose? Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, well, for me, at least it was a her, it's a, a female person speaking. Um, and it, it's this kind of love story that shines through there. And the, the love interest probably is a man. I think a few of the poems give that away. When you say her, you're not saying me, right? That's, that's quite intentional then. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Obviously, um, a few of the poems, or well, probably all of the poems, have a lot to do with me. But for me, it's always um, important to make that distinction that not everything that I write is actually true. Like there is there is some fictional element to poetry, and it's kind of funny because my mom she does not speak a lot of English, um, but she tries and translates my poems. And then sometimes she. Uh, asks me oh uh, Christina tell me about that and what does that mean because she just thinks that everything that I write is about me literally and sometimes it's just not or it, it, it's just that the phrase sounded good or that the words kind of just were a good fit yeah that's the beauty of being a poet right we can fictionalize some elements and make life a little bit more beautiful or a little bit more dramatic or whatever we want really you know yeah um, would you like to start with a, a re reading a poem for us, please? Yeah, I can. Um, I think I'm going to read Heroin Wading Through Water. A grey heron was obstructing my path in the middle of the summerly woods, smelling of green and air. I remember it was near a zoo, a fugitive, a misplaced augury, perhaps. The heron appeared a few steps in front of me, out of the blue, on the soft, organic, narrow forest trail, immovable like a stone with watchful eyes. It seemed giant and gloomy and alien in the waterless, woody drought. Solely for you, I managed to walk past it, 
in fear, shaking, trembling, but victorious. The heron didn't move one bit. What became of it, I don't know. I didn't attempt to take the auspices. When I told you of my bravery, you were proud of me and my heart was bubbling lava. But now, creeping from the depth of my gut feeling, just before I fall for a warm, foggy dream, I feel like the heron has reappeared. It's sitting in the dark for sure. I can't see it, but it's there, suddenly scary again. A barrier, stone gray and frightening, insuperable without bait. An unfavorable omen, an obstacle without question. Perfect. Do you want to do you want to um, tell me something about that poem? Was it an observation or was it a combination of observations or didn't it happen at all? Uh, it did happen actually and I took a picture of the heron um, that was obstructing my path and initially the poem appeared in goat's milk along with the photograph um, and I, I have a phobia, a bird phobia. Yeah. Um, I, I absolutely hate pigeons, like the, the pigeons that, that are at home in cities and that are really tame and not afraid and don't go away. Um, so it was actually pretty scary for me to encounter that heron there on the path. Um, and I did walk past it. And then just months later, when I was in Ireland, I just kind of thought back of that. And I don't, I don't know why, it just, the memory suddenly popped into my head and this poem came out of me, out of nowhere. It was kind of strange. Maybe it was some sort of feverish dream or something. I don't know. Well, it could be uh, kind of like, well, I, I have a tendency to make everything really dramatic. <laughs> I'm that kind of poet, but like, it could be some sort of um, victory moment, no? Like you have this phobia and there's this bird and you walk past it anyway. So it's a big, a little bit of a mi milestone, no? Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, I do, I do love your accent because it is literally a mix of Irish and and German because you have the Irish R. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. How long have you been living in Ireland? Um, it's been two years now, and a, a little bit more than that. And you teach English, right? Because I remember when I started butchering your manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> taught me a lot <laughs> so, oh, yeah <laughs> oh, no. thanks for that no um, problem. I just want to come across as that teacher person but somehow I just can't seem to stop it teachers know. are teachers like that's the first question I asked she's like I was like oh my god you're an English teacher right I'm so embarrassed <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> no no it's really good you taught me a lot can I ask you um, about your title, Illumin Illuminations at Nightfall? How did that one pop in your mind? Um, I had, initially I had this image in my head of uh, the old cliff bath and Ennis Crone here. And I think I had it on the title page because I initially wanted to have photographs in the manuscript and then, then we just didn't do that. Um, but the sunset there is really beautiful and the colors that the sun paints there is they're just really mesmerizing. Um, and I just kind of thought of that as the title because sometimes we just feel like we're enlightened or inspired by the evening light and by sunsets. And I think everyone loves sunsets. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, yeah totally. But sometimes they can also be misleading and they, they're just kind of the last bit of light that you see before the night comes and the world gets really dark. So I just kind of wanted to play with that because illuminations, they, they can be enlightening or kind of deceiving. And yeah, yeah that's why I picked it. Yeah, I like that. And the cover um, that we ended up going with is also, well, it shows a little bit of that, doesn't it? Like, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great fit for the yeah, title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. I love it. Who are some of your liter literary or artistic crushes? Mm. Um, that's a hard one because I could name a lot. <laughs> I um, bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but from like in an Irish context, I really love William Butler Yeats. Mm -hmm. because he was sort of the first poet that I really liked. Because I remember that in school, I didn't 
really enjoy poetry, the German yeah. poetry, and yeah. at least I kind of just didn't really connect with it. Um, and then when I um, came across Yeats' poems, I just fell in love with them because they have all these references to Irish landscape and all that. And I just kind of immediately felt uh, a lot of love for that. Um, and then I really love Ocean Wang. I mm -hmm. read his novel uh, recently, and then I also really cherish his poems. Um, who else is there? I really li like uh, Megan Nolan's novel, Acts of Desperation, because it's just such a messed up love story, really. And I just, I just really love reading that. Yeah. Or um, Sally Rooney. Yeah. I just love the writing style. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to be poetry that ex that inspires you, because you mentioned a lot of novels. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy reading novels um, and I, I do enjoy poetry as well. Maybe I should name a few more poets. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, actually, um, Chloe Hanks, um, I have her poetry book um, just in the sitting room there and I like every morning before I go to school, I drink my coffee there. And then sometimes when the weather is good in Ireland, which is kind of rare to be honest, but <laughs> if there is sunlight coming in through the window, then I just sit there, enjoy my coffee and read one or two poems from Chloe Hanks and get into a really good witchy vibe. So nice. I really love that. Yeah, yeah. She, she wrote a little a bit of praise for your book, right? So, so she did, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. When I read your book, I, it, it made me think of Chloe, not because you write the same things, but just there's this kind of magical vibe thing going on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I cast some spells there in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to read one? Because there's one, there's one, there's actually a lit literally one that's called Verhexed. Verhexed. This time round, I'm only calm as the falling autumn leaves that bear a new beginning. There is no pressure building up as the slippery wet fall does not require an outcome. Today, one year ago, I conceived. I'm bearing the fruits until they ripen. The candle on my nightstand smells of sweet vanilla and cotton. Its flickering scent is fogging my thoughts. Honey quoted, my fingers fumble. The gray wolf is to be trusted. His howling hurricane instilled a frail but beautiful fire the first time round in summer. Wolves thrive in October rituals. My iron eyelids are falling heavily, slowly, heavenly. My breath is steady as I mindlessly dream, or maybe I won't. As soon as I switch off the lights, my pulse races, headless through the darkness. Yeah. And for the people that don't speak German, verhext is German for bewitched, it says. We put little yeah. footnotes in for the, for the German words. Yeah. Do you want to you have the same word in, in Dutch? Yeah, um, oh you know what i would in dutch a witch is a hex so that's that's okay. yeah, yeah. which would be whew, hexed. i don't know if we have one word for it actually i have to i have to get back to you on that okay <laughs> it's Maybe the same so <laughs> yeah it's the same with you like because you said you were six when you wrote your first english poem right yeah, well, I tried. It wasn't yeah. a great thing, but I tried. But that's amazing because that must have been something uh, that was already inside of you then, like the love for English language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just loved the pop music that was on the radio and I thought it was really cool and yeah. I couldn't understand it. And maybe that's why I thought it was cool and like a, like a riddle that I had to solve. And that's why I, I just translated the lyrics of my favorite songs. I think that's how I... Uh, started, started yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's the same with me I, I write I'm obviously Dutch and I write my poems or whatever they are in English 
because it's easier for me in that language somehow. So when you ask me for the Dutch word <laughs> of the yeah. I can't, I, I have to Google it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have another question for you, and that is, what is the key theme or message of the book? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I would really like to um, just leave that up to the reader, because yeah. uh, the my, my English teacher actually in school, he taught us that we should never interpret our own art, or that a good artist would never do that. So I just kind of don't want to fall into that trap now. But um, I would say that a few themes are love, heartbreak, trauma, probably, um, and finding healing or solace in, in nature or spirituality. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely in there. And I agree with you completely. And and that actually made me think of, of this little story someone once told me about like an artist there was like uh, a, a piece of art on the wall and then this group of critics was like uh, interpreting it and analyzing it and then from the back of the room someone said like no 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 that that's I don't think that is what the artist meant at all and then they were like excuse me who are you and he's like I'm the artist <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah I, I, li I like that and that's what I love about 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 text yeah that's the beauty of this of of of, of words right because I used to study photography and for me it was always like photographers and painters are are way they they if you if you don't mind what you're doing you might be dictating way too much of what you want the audience to take away from it and that's the beauty of of the written word because if i when i read your poems i see different landscapes obviously than someone else reading your poems and you see different landscapes yeah okay that yeah yeah, yeah okay this is also a very good one i think what would you say are common traps for aspiring writers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I definitely fell into a few of them, I believe. Um, so I think the first thing is never, ever be put off by rejection. Yeah. Um, because I, I tried really hard. I think I started submitting about a year ago or maybe a little bit more. And I got so many rejections and uh, then, uh, to be honest, when I look back, when I now look back at the poems that I submitted at first, they they're not great. Like maybe some of them are okay or it's a start, but they they're not as good as the poetry that did get published in the end. Um, but I was really put down by that, and I thought, oh gosh, I'm I'm not a poet, I'm not a writer. Uh, I've always known it. I can't do this, and my parents are right. I should just yeah. get a proper job and be a teacher and just. <laughs> kind of leave it you can do both um, yeah exactly but then there's always this little voice in your head that tells you to kind of just stop and play small um but I I didn't I just kept going and I looked back at the poems that were rejected and I just kind of realized well okay maybe this is just not good enough um and then I also started reading a lot more poetry than I did before and noticed what makes poetry great and maybe not so great. Um, and then I just kept going and I, I, I was lucky and I, I had a lot of um, acceptances in the summer and then the ball just got rolling and I was so happy about that. Um, and then another trap is probably to kind of write Instagram poetry, mm. if I can say so. I, I don't want to insult anyone because there's really good poetry on Instagram, mm -hmm. but there are poets that write poetry that is maybe two lines or three or four lines and it's actually more like um, an aphorism or like a, like a little saying that you would put in a calendar <laughs> or a <one>. toilet roll <laughs> yeah. you'll be yeah. very nuanced <laughs> literally <laughs> Um, but there, some of them are really successful and they have millions of followers and they sell their books and they get really rich from doing that. And mm -hmm. for a while, I just looked at that and I was just like, oh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. My poems are 40, 50 lines and nobody reads them and I'm not making millions of it. And maybe I should just write four liners and try to get famous with that or something. But then I just 
realize it's not authentic to me and it's not great and I don't yeah. enjoy doing that no, exactly uh, there's a way though you know because obviously Instagram is a really good tool to find uh, your read or connect with readers but um, I wrote an article once about that's like you don't have to write the four lines you know but you can uh, and you don't have to give away your poetry for free all the time either, because that's another thing, right? With Instagram, you're consuming, consuming, consuming. But what you can do is post a fragment or like one beautiful sentence from a longer poem that you think might capture the attention of. Um, so yeah, you don't have to, you can, yeah, you can, it's just about using the tool and, and, and people on Instagram, most people on Instagram have short attention spans. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, you have to capture them in the square, you know? But yeah. I think you don't have to um, water down your writing. So. <laughs> and I think we're guilty of that as well. Because when I open Instagram, sometimes I just do it because I'm bored and I'm maybe I just have one or two minutes. Yeah. And then I don't have time, maybe a really good and longer poem pops up in my feed and I don't read it because no. I don't have the time. And then maybe I forget to read it later when I do have time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I just feel bad about it. I can, but also, I can also relate that sometimes you just maybe enjoy the two or three liner because you can read it really quickly and relate. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you post your work only on Instagram or also on, a, on, on your blog? Do you have a blog on your website? Um, no, I don't have a blog. Um, I have a website, but yeah. Um, yeah, well, I have a link tree there to all my online publications or print publications. Um, and I do post excerpts um, of that on Instagram or full poems as well sometimes. Um, and I did the Escape Real Challenge in yeah. April, the uh, National Poetry Writing Month. So that was when I posted a lot of poetry. But then again, sometimes I, I, I wrote an early draft and then I felt like, okay, maybe this could be really good and it could be great for submission to a magazine. And then I didn't post it because as soon as you do, you kind of burn that poem and you can't submit it to magazines anymore. Wait, then, is, is that a thing? Yeah, do, do, do magazines not accept it because it's been on Instagram? Yeah, uh, some some still accept it, but if you you're submitting to magazines that are kind of more established or yeah. uh, may might, might even pay, yeah, um, you can't have it on Instagram prior to publication. I find that very interesting because to me that's a little bit elitist, you know. Because yeah. you know, I think magazines, uh, editors, and and publishers should be there to support your work, and they should want your work to be seen by as many people as possible, right? So I find mm -hmm. that really. But I guess we are still in a sort of transition mode, aren't we? Like it's the same with the self-publishing thing. It's like people say self-publishing is a vanity thing, or people won't take it serious some bookstores won't stock your book if it's self-published but I think that there's a shift going on and I think the self-publishing thing is is being taken more seriously you know it's just yeah. still quite new isn't it so um, I, you said before um because that's got stuck in my brain um you didn't know if or you said like my poetry back then wasn't good enough so what is what is good poetry to you then um, it probably has some poetic techniques, um, which these early poems probably had, but um, they weren't well done. This is the English um, teacher speaking, eh? <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> good poetic techniques, and they have to be well done, um, as well as good punctuation, grammar, syntax, all that. You have to have all that. Um, but I'm not sure why they weren't good. It's hard to pinpoint why exactly. I don't think they were great, but it, to me, it just felt like um, a collection of words that meant something to me, but then didn't probably didn't really mean a lot to other people. I think that's what made, made them less good than my poetry now. They didn't have as much context. They felt kind of a little bit mystical, but a little bit cryptic. But then in the end, who decides whether a poem is good or bad, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is very true. 
<laughs> but it wasn't good enough for these magazines or the elitist uh, magazines that they just didn't take. And I can see why, because they published something completely different. This is also important, right? Like when you submit to magazines, you have to know what you're submitting to and if your work fits the, well, the editor basically, right? It just has, has to connect at the right time. So, and, and, oh yeah, I had another question about that because you said, I've been reading a lot of poetry since then. Um, this is also the way I learn because, well, obviously that was very clear to you that <laughs> when I send you back your manuscript that I have no formal training in this but this is how I learn as well by reading other people's poetry and then when you go back to your older work you're like oh I can do way better now you know it just clicks and you can rewrite your poems so is that how you learn as well then yeah totally I feel like that too and um there's always like this kind of dialogue between poems because it's, I think it's important to know what's already been said and what's already kind of like out there and to be able to communicate with that and have to have this kind of intertextuality. Um, I think that's really important. I, I, I believe that everything's already been said before, but not by you. So yeah, yeah that's, that's what makes you, you, you work unique, you know? Yeah, for sure. Like, especially with love poetry or even war poetry, like there's these basic themes in poetry and everything has basically been said already, but yeah, just in a different way. And you kind of just have to be aware of what has been said and how it's been said to be able to um, relate to that and just make something unique. Just to... Um... Uh, elaborate on the good poetry thing do you think you have to be like someone that feels emotions very strongly in order to be a poet for me personally it can be both because sometimes I feel very strongly about something um, and then a poem is a great way to just get rid of that and just uh, kind of to pour it on the page and then it's gone yeah, for a like while at least catharsis uh, yeah yeah totally um but then again sometimes it's just I just write with no particular emotion at all I just have an idea that feels very rational and very sober kind of or sometimes I, sometimes I just read a poem and then I feel inspired because I get an idea from that and I just put it on the page without feeling heartbroken even though it is about heartbreak so I think it just depends on the person if if you feel emotions strongly or not, or sometimes it just also helps you to access your emotions if you kind of numb out what you're feeling and you yeah. don't really know what's inside you. As soon as you start writing, suddenly there can be waves of emotions and you kind of suddenly are able to access that. That's interesting. I've never thought about that before, but that yeah yeah when reading other people's poetry and that I guess that's that's the thing you, you you can be emotional or not emotional but the thing I think a poet has to be able to do is see and in their own way you know observe and 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 then I think it's it's fantastic that we we can relate to other people's poetry you know that's that's I guess what it's all about the connection and now I'm going to be quiet and let you read another poem. Burnt cookies in cold hands. This froze up winter lake is a glossy mirror covered in fairy tale frost. We stand breathing, forming foggy clouds. You resemble familiarity, the pleasant pulsing of stiff blue fingers, the stinging hot needles in my chest. There once was a cozy crackling fire and the smell of hot chocolate homemade vanilla cookies, crumbled and crunchy. Merely a pale memory, but my nose remembers. I smell childhood on your neck, home behind your ears. The wondrous scent of the past is ghostly, uncannily lovely, ghastly. My pupils widened. My limbic system recalls the raging icy aftermath. Those horse legs of mine start running wildly, into the fierce biting cold onto the frosty lake. For a minute, I am steady, light, sliding on the ice, 
safely and elegant, briefly in balance. Your pallid blue eyes pierce me from the lake shore. I hear the ice break, crack, crumble beneath me. Will I turn into a frosty mermaid or cross the distance to your snuggly paws, expecting me to fight, flee the sweet sugary horrors and dreams of hot chocolate and vanilla cookies? The scent makes me dizzy. I'm soaring in a vacuum of nothingness, not yet destined nor damned. Thank you. <laughs> Can you, do you, can you, or do you want to tell me what this poem is about for you? I can, yeah. Um, for me, this poem deals with relationship anxiety mm -hmm. and with attachment styles. Um, this uh, person speaking here is certainly <laughs> not very comfortable with relationships and like the the commitment or even the insecurity that comes with loving someone being loved and there there is this layer of childhood trauma like where the this attachment style comes from because she thinks of her vanilla cookies and the hot chocolate that she got as a child but it kind of it, it, it is kind of cozy but painful at the same time yeah nice I'm going to yeah. find another question because now I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, not a great mood to be. <laughs> no, but it's very recognizable. So it's like it's a, it's a beautiful yeah. poem. Um, so, yeah, you didn't actually answer this one in the interview, but do you like, does your family read your work or, or your friends or like people in real life? Uh, yeah, my, my sister actually, she reads most of my poetry yeah. um, and she read, she proofread the manuscript before I submitted that to you. Um, and she it was proofread. double proofread, Jesus. Oh, I never yeah. see <laughs> Is she an English yeah. teacher too? <laughs> no, she's not an English teacher, but she's studying English. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're both into English a lot and she, she loves literature and poetry and so I give most of my work to her, especially like before I submit it or when it's important. Um, and I just try to get her feedback and that's really, really precious to me that she does that for me because it, it just helps me grow and sometimes she just raises my awareness about things that I might improve or that are good because I uh, can be very critical of my own work. Mm, yeah. So yeah. I think that, that most uh, writers or artists are like that, that they're really yeah. harsh on themselves. Yeah, yeah. The, good, the good ones are, in my opinion, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it's lovely that, you're, that you have that connection with your sister because she's also then kind of your cheerleader, no? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah and nice. She always encouraged me to just keep submitting. And last year, I still remember how she always told me, oh, that's normal. Everyone gets rejections. You will get there and, and just keep submitting. And I was like, oh, God, this is so draining. And I'm not the yeah. most patient person while I am in school. But outside of school, I'm not because <laughs> all my patience is being used up there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> How, how old are the children you teach? Uh, I think they're 11 to oh, 18 secondary school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah, no, kudos to you. <laughs> yeah, I get why, you, why your patient is being drained. <laughs> it can happen. Yeah. No, it's nice to have your sister. That, but does she... Um, um, because we talked about that earlier, like the, she understands probably that um, not every poem is something that happened to you and she probably can uh, um, distance herself from the fact that you are her sister as well then? I think so, yeah. Sometimes yeah. Um, because she knows me so well, um, she realizes that some parts are inspired by my personal life and most of the poems are to be honest but she also realizes that sometimes I just make it more dramatic or just yeah just more dramatic or, <laughs> as you said more beautiful um and, and she she knows that she's aware of that yeah 
Yeah. If you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? Um, I would tell my younger writing self to never give up and to believe in herself because I've been writing most of my life, I think. Um, but I never believed that I was any good or I always used to dream of becoming a poet or becoming a published writer and for most of my life I just thought that was impossible it was just a dream and I never even kind of, I never tried I didn't know how really and then when I came to Ireland I don't know why I don't really know how it happened but suddenly I just started writing more seriously and then discovered uh, all these opportunities to submit and I just tried and I don't I don't you know why I never did that before but well I, I guess I lived in London for a while and I guess when you move abroad you have to you have uh, the opportunity to reinvent yourself right so um, also because you mentioned um, yeah trauma that's that's the thing you know what obviously your trauma is always going to be there but when you move somewhere else you get a clean slate you are just your name and there aren't people around you that go like, oh yeah, remember when you were young and you did this and that? It's like, you know, th th that stuff is gone. So you can just be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a poet now, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure it, it was that, that Ireland just played a huge part in that. that I, I came here as this new person, sort of. Yeah. And, and well, if when I read your poetry and also by the things you're saying, Ireland also inspires you to write. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I do believe that there, we're, we're not always born where we thrive, you know? So I think it's great that you uprooted yourself and then put yourself in soil that made you um, write this beautiful book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a huge step to be like, I've always felt this connection with Ireland and it's just a dream come true to be here now and just to be living and working here. That's, I'm, I'm so lucky and just to be so close to the beach and the sea, it's just what I've always wanted, I guess. And, and, and you, I think you should be proud of that because it's something that you did yourself. You moved yourself there, so. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be a psychotherapist again. Okay, next question. <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, um, I think um, I, I could be quite persuasive as a child or as a yeah. teenager. Maybe that's when it started. I don't, I'm not really sure. But there were a few instances like in school where I would kind of speak to the teachers in a way that I just felt they would appreciate or that just using their own voc very specific vocabulary or their own phrases that they just like to use. And that always worked. And like they were in favor of what I was saying when I kind of spoke like them. And yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds very manipulative, um, and I was as a teenager, but I'm not anymore. I can promise you that. I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> All teenagers are to some extent now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's interesting, actually. Also, that you admit that. I love that, you know? It's like, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we should do one more poem, and then I'm going to leave you in peace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I think maybe it's just maybe it's nice to just read the last poem of the book and go then we can all go to bed and sleep yeah that would be great yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an hour ahead of you and I'm an old woman so I need my nap <laughs> oh yeah it's it's 8 p.m here now so I'm an old woman as well I'll go to bed very soon <laughs> all right heaven I crawl back into the corner of my orbit where time stands still on the wooden wall clock and sparkly stars twinkle over my canopy bed, red and golden, illuminating my tired eyes to dream of space adventures. My pillow smells of the dent in your chin. I'm slowly falling for a feverish night, 
the soft drizzling of the universe rain on the roof of my ethereal sanctuary reminds me of your gently whispered, Gute Nacht. Now I can rest and sleep and recover. There you go. Good night. Yes, yeah, it's good to end with good night. <laughs> I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna read your the blurb of your book because I forgot to do that at the start, so people actually know what the book is about. <laughs> Oh yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put it in, in front of what we just said. But okay. <laughs> Illuminations at nightfall is a oh no, this is Chloe Hanks's thing, but it's nice to read that. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, this is the marketing thing that Chloe wrote. <laughs> oh great. <laughs> <laughs> Illuminations at nightfall is a stunning collection from Christina Hannemann. Hers is poetry that casts shapes, both haunting and somewhat supernatural. With each turn of the page, the words seems, seem to cut deeper, pausing barely for breath. Yet ultimately, this is a pamphlet that reads much like basking beneath the stars at night, looking for purpose in something intricate. Poems are visceral, the story is captivating. Hanneman bears all to, all to offer a body of work that seems to be heard and a voice that echoes beyond the turning of the last page. I think that's really beautiful. And I think that nails this collection as well. And I want to thank you for letting me publish it. And oh, no, thank you. That's, it's been such a great opportunity. Thank you so much. For me as well, like I said before, you taught me, <laughs> you taught me a, a ton about adjectives and stuff. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you so much it was lovely talking to you and um, i want everybody to to buy your book really so i'll leave all the links in the description is there anything you you would like to say uh no, no not really just maybe thank you again for publishing this and, and thanks to chloe for writing this beautiful breath it really kind of made me tear up a little bit because it was first time i ever read uh, about my own poetry from someone else and it, it yeah. was really beautiful yeah, that must be a special experience. Yeah, very special. Wait until you get the um, final copy in your mailbox. That's going to make you cry. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure will. <laughs> Can't wait. Oh, okay, thank you so much. And I'll, um, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>